Hi, my name is Nick Kuntz, and I'm a neuroradiologist and head and neck imager at Indiana University School of Medicine. And over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to be discussing pitfalls in perfusion and stroke imaging and how to avoid these errors in perfusion imaging. I'd like to say up front that uh, my site uses Rapid for perfusion CT, and I will be using uh, Rapid images basically because that's what I have at my disposal. Um, but this is simply not a tacit endorsement of uh, any product line. Um, I have no financial disclosures to make. I would like to thank Jim Milburn, who was kind enough to lend me a case for this presentation. So thanks, Jim. So perfusion CT has really become a first-line modality for the evaluation of stroke. And it allows us to very reproducibly and quite accurately evaluate the brain for penumbra, which is ischemic but potentially salvageable brain, as well as infarct core, which we can think of as dead brain. But it's not a perfect tool. And over the next several minutes, I hope to provide you a very pragmatic review of some of the common pitfalls and how to avoid them. So first, we'll start off by talking about technical pitfalls. Now, every time I approach a perfusion CT, in my mind, I go through this checklist. It's a quality control checklist, uh, and we'll cover each of these topics in succession. First of all, I look for patient motion artifact, and that's because perfusion CT is a sine acquisition of numerous successive gantry rotations. So if the patient moves during image acquisition, that can result in inaccurate estimation and calculation of ischemic penumbra and core infarction, and it can also result in misregistration artifact, as you can see in this case on the prognostic map, where all of the areas of predicted uh, ischemia and, and uh, core infarction are shifted a little bit. How do you fix this problem? Well, you may have to repeat the image acquisition, and it may be helpful in some cases, uh, cases to, to uh, tape the patient's head in place so they don't move so much. So this is what it looks like on the source perfusion CT imaging. We see all that streak artifact and blur that's caused by patient motion. And on the right, you can see each of these graphs, and these represent the actual X and Y and Z axis rotation and, and displacement to sort of quantify the degree of motion artifact. It's also important to keep in mind that perfusion CT imaging needs to be done with the patient's head in neutral position. So if the patient tilts their head or they have any lateral angulation, that's going to impair our acquisition and post-processing. And that's because the software uses the contralateral side as a reference. And if you tilt the chin, either extension or flexion, that may include non-brain structures into the imaged field of view. Those may get interpreted as part of the brain when in reality you're imaging the skull base or orbits. So here's an example of a patient who had their head malpositioned during a perfusion CT acquisition. And on first glance, you might very superficially think, well, you know, maybe where the white arrow is pointing, the relative cerebral blood flow is a little bit low on the right. And where the red arrow is pointing, maybe the cerebral blood volume is down compared to the contralateral side. And that's what the computer thought, too. It spit out this region of right frontal penumbra. But what the black arrow is pointing at isn't the contralateral frontal lobe, it's the contralateral temporal lobe, and it's right where the MCA runs through. So of course it has increased perfusion locally within that area. So what we're looking at here is fictitious penumbra that's created as an artifact because the patient was positioned in a crooked manner in the scanner. And so you can try to read through that or you may just need to repeat those images to be certain. It's also important to keep in mind that oftentimes CT perfusion is done in a manner to optimize assessment of the middle cerebral artery territory. And you can see these yellow bars show the field of view that was acquired in this case. So anything beyond that is excluded. And this is one of the reasons why posterior fossa is oftentimes a challenge with imaging perfusion, uh, CT imaging of the head, uh, because in this case it's excluded from field of view in many cases. So be aware of these blinders. You need to know what you have imaged, and importantly, know what you haven't imaged. Next thing, look at your arterial and venous selection. So the computer, typically with these software, uh, it will uh, automatically select your arterial input function and your venous outflow function. Usually for the AIF, it picks the A2-ACA. Uh, for the VOF, it oftentimes picks the torcular herophily. Um, but if you have the improper AIF or VOF selected by the computer, it's obviously going to mess up your parametric maps and, and give you garbage. So in this case, you can see that the VOF looks okay, but it selected the right petrous apex as the arterial input function, so that's not going to give you ad accurate uh, assessment of perfusion. If you pick the wrong AIF, oftentimes you result in overestimation of the mean transit time and underestimation of the cerebral blood flow. 
And with the wrong VOF, you may have overestimation of the cerebral blood volume and the cerebral blood flow. The next thing I look at is the time activity curve. And when you approach this, you really need to know what a normal time activity curve should look like. And so this is an example of that. So artery is the red uh, tracing, vein is the blue tracing. So what you'll see as an observation is that the artery enhances earlier than the vein. That makes sense. The artery returns to baseline faster than the vein does. The vein tends to enhance later than the artery, shows up later, but it lasts longer with that enhancement. Now the vein may have more than one peak as well. The artery should not. This is a clearly abnormal time activity curve. Whenever you see an abnormal time activity curve, that's not the problem itself, but rather that's a sign of an underlying problem and you need to troubleshoot that. So it may be an issue of losing peripheral IV access, maybe an issue with the injection rate being incorrect, Maybe the patient's in heart failure. They could have an underlying cardiac arrhythmia. Maybe they have extracranial carotid artery stenosis or proximal intracranial uh, arterial stenosis. And sometimes they have a shower of multiple intracranial emboli as well that impairs that forward flow. And then one other thing to keep in mind is perhaps you didn't image long enough. Um, you can truncate this time activity curve if you don't image long enough, and that's why Oftentimes it's recommended that you acquire these over the course of a minute, previously recommended maybe around 45 seconds. So you don't want to cut it off too early uh, and truncate that time activity curve. The next thing I look at is the contrast bolus. In this case, I'm looking in cine mode at all of the source data images and nothing is opacifying. Now if we look at the, uh, on the left, you can see the time activity curve that just doesn't exist. So in this case, the patient's IV had infiltrated. Here's a case really driving home the point of why I think it's important to look at the source data. This was the very first stroke one uh, or brain attack that I looked at as a fellow. And you can see on the non-contrast CT, nothing too impressive. Here's our CTA on first glance, also really not that impressive. And here's our perfusion CT that was acquired just after the CTA. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of phases of this as we wash in. Now you may notice that there's a little bit of hypotenuation within the right frontal operculum. That's an area of ischemia. But importantly, we have increasing density uh, at the tip of the yellow arrow. Perhaps if you're very eagle-eyed, you'll see it at the tip of the red arrow on the CTA. This is a patient who had received uh, TPA at an outside hospital before they got to us, and they had a pretty rapid hemorrhagic uh, transformation of their infarction. Uh, and what we're seeing here is them actually having active extravasation and bleeding on the table during their perfusion CT. So always, always, always look at the perfusion CT source data um, I think it can be very helpful, uh, and I think looking at it in cine mode uh, is quite an easy way to do that. All right, next we're going to move on to some interpretive pitfalls. And those can be broadly classified into three categories. We're going to start with misclassification of the core infarction and ischemic penumbra. So the perfusion CT software may inadvertently include adjacent structures like the skull base and the orbits as part of the brain. And unfortunately, those get miscalculated as regions of hypoperfusion. Uh, and those can result in overestimations of the penumbra and core infarct volumes. So some of the common culprits include the skull base and the orbits, as well as extra axial lesions. So here where the yellow arrow is pointing, it looks like maybe we have some hypoperfusion at the right anterior temporal uh, lobe. But look at our non-contrast CT. This is just a simple benign arachnoid cyst in a very typical location. So drive home the point, it's really critical to look at your CT images as well. This is that example of the orbits artifact. You can see the areas that are shaded in green. It's calculating those as areas of ischemic penumbra, but in reality, that's just the orbits. So whatever it's reporting to you as the calculated penumbra volume, you know that's uh, fictitiously elevated. So be aware of this common overestimation artifact. Next topic to be aware of is the ghost infarct core. And this is simply a manifestation of the fact that perfusion CT imaging can overestimate your core infarction. This tends to be a time dependent phenomenon. So the earlier that you image them in the course of their ischemia with a perfusion CT, the more likely you're gonna get some of this ghost infarct core. This also seems to be associated with uh, truncation of the time activity curve. So maybe you're not imaging them long enough in the perfusion CT process. Um, and also, the prior reports have been associated with using the CBV core infarct thresholds, previously reported thresholds, rather than using CBF thresholds like uh, RAPID uses, for instance. So here's a case that was lent to me by uh, Jim Milburn. And uh, you can see the images I have up are the prethrombectomy images. 
there's a large region of prolonged mean transit time, and there's sort of a matched area of markedly reduced cerebral blood volume. So this looks like it should be an area of core infarction. Well, he was taken to thrombectomy, did quite well. You can see uh, the post-thrombectomy MRI. There's really not much in the way of reduced diffusivity, maybe a little bit in the temporal lobe and the basal ganglia and the right frontal operculum, but it doesn't match at all what we see as predicted as core infarction on, on the uh, uh, perfusion CT imaging. So this is just a nice example of the ghost infarct core uh, that you can get from um, uh, imaging them very early on, perhaps uh, truncating the time activity curve or using CBV thresholds rather than CBF thresholds for infarction. Another topic to know about is luxury perfusion. This is when you have a return of blood flow to the infarcted brain due to either a loss of autoregulation or permeable blood-brain barrier. Um, and this gives you either normal or supernormal, i.e. hyperperfused flow. So kind of across the board, all of your parameters are gonna be up. Um, but it's important to look at the non-contrast CT because that will confirm the infarction. And this is something that's typically seen in the subacute phase of an infarction, but it can creep into the first 24 hours. So be aware of it as part of your brain attack or your stroke one uh, possibilities. Perfusion CT is not great for looking at small volume infarctions, whether it's cortex or basal ganglia. Um, so you really need to scrutinize the non-contrast CT. So here's an example. We see a focal hypoattenuation within the right basal ganglia, but the CBF and TBACs look pretty reasonable. Well, this was confirmed as an acute infarction with our diffusion weighted imaging. So again, perfusion CT, it's limited in its assessment for small volumes of ischemia. It's important to keep in mind that proximal stenoses can also mess up your perfusion CT, whether it's extracranial or intracranial stenoses. This tends to cause a prolongation of the mean transit time and an underestimation of cerebral blood flow. The consequence of this is it tends to overestimate your penumbra, and underestimate your core infarction. So that's really a bad combination. So it's quite critical to scrutinize the CTA in all of these perfusion CTs. Uh, you can combat this by doing delayed corrected perfusion CT that may give you a more accurate assessment. So this was a patient, that same patient that had that very tight proximal stenosis within the uh, right extracranial internal carotid artery. You can see that it's picking just virtually the entirety of, of the MCA per, uh, distribution as, as being at risk and infarcted. And uh, really, it's, it's of limited accuracy when you're dealing with that kind of proximal stenosis. So you really need to scrutinize that CTA. Next uh, general topic would be misclassification of the acuity of ischemia. So perfusion CT for chronic infarctions can be confusing. And, and that's because chronic infarctions have low perfusion, but it's not zero perfusion they have some perfusion. So uh, perfusion CT for that reason is limited in differentiating what's acute infarction versus chronic infarction. So in this case, we have this markedly reduced area of cerebral blood flow uh, in the, on the left, denoted here by the white arrow. But if we look at the non-contrast CT, we can see that that's chronic encephalomalacia and gliosis from a remote infarction rather than an acute infarction. So it's critical to look at that non-contrast CT. And then lastly, we're gonna wrap up by talking about some stroke mimics. So seizures can result in abnormal perfusion. It's thought that maybe even up to a third of the time, if you were to do CT perfusion, you'd see perfusion abnormalities. Um, most commonly, uh, we'll see areas of focal hypoperfusion, and that's what this white arrow is denoting. But sometimes you'll see areas of hyperperfusion as well. Um, and sometimes you get a mixed pattern, like in this case, where we have the hyperperfusion anteriorly and the hypoperfusion posteriorly. Importantly, this is sparing the basal ganglia, so that may be a helpful discriminator. So here's that same patient, seizure-related changes. You can see sort of across the board, we've got hypoperfusion posteriorly, hyperperfusion anteriorly. Uh, there was no reduced diffusivity. And interestingly enough, this patient had bilateral mesial temporal sclerosis. So when you see that mixed perfusion pattern, don't forget about seizures. The clinical history is going to be very helpful in, in teasing that out. You can uncommonly have perfusional abnormalities with migraines, particularly with, with uh, complicated migraines. Uh, during the aura phase of the complicated migraine, they may have hypoperfusion. Uh, during the headache phase, uh, they may have some hyperperfusion, and that's what this patient had in the left temporal lobe. And that may be confounded by their physical exam and their clinical presentation. They may show up with a hemiplegic migraine, and that can certainly be a, a very uh, difficult thing to tease out uh, until it starts to resolve. Lastly, don't forget about brain tumors and treatment-related changes. Uh, certainly, those can be associated with uh, altered cerebral hemodynamics.
You may have some areas that have internal hyperperfusion. It may be surrounded by regions of general hypoperfusion, as this case shows. Um, and so it's really critical to evaluate the non-contrast CT uh, that comes along with the CT perfusion. So here's that same patient. You can see sort of a general region of relative hypoperfusion in the left frontal lobe, but there are some internal areas, like right where the white arrow is pointing, that have some increased perfusion. Uh, here's the non-contrast CT, sort of seeing the confluent uh, hypoattenuation within the left frontal lobe. And then here's the associated contrast enhanced MRI, some areas of nodular enhancement that, that more or less correspond with the areas where we're seeing some, some increased perfusion. So the take home point here in all of that is don't read the perfusion CT independent of your other cross-sectional imaging. So in summary, perfusion CT is really an important first line modality for the evaluation of stroke. Radiologists need to be aware of some of the common pitfalls that are associated with it. And I think it's quite helpful to use a standard perfusion CT quality control checklist. At least go through it in your mind when you approach each of these cases. And then lastly, always, always, always interpret that perfusion CT in light of the associated non-contrast CT and the associated CT angiography findings. With that, I thank you for your attention and enjoy the rest of the meeting.